Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Crateros, uh, the name of our project, comes from the 4th century Greek historian, 4th century BC, right, who was a member of the uh, Antigonid family um, and was the governor of central Greece, uh, which gave him the time and opportunity to wander around collecting Attic decrees, um, decrees of the people of Athens, and to formulate a diplomatic history of Athens on the basis of that. Um, we picked that as the name for our project for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because we're kind of doing a similar thing to what Crateros did in terms of being uh, new media um, epigraphic collectors, right? Um, so for Crateros, this idea of wandering around and actually using squeezes, or squeezes, excuse me, using inscriptions in bulk as the stuff of your history um, was a rather revolutionary idea. And we're taking that and using this idea that you know, we should be uh, digitizing and expanding the reach of inscriptions yet again. Secondly, the great bulk of our material in the collection of squeezes at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, is from Athens and Attica, um, as I'll kind of talk about that, that breadth a little bit later. Um, but we thought, given that overlap of both uh, what we're doing and where a lot of our material comes from, Crateros was an appropriate name. Um, so before we get all the way into the collection, um, I want to talk a little bit about squeezes themselves. Um, because my guess is that uh, many of you have probably never worked with squeezes. And some of you may be unfamiliar with squeezes generally, uh, since they're not uh, broadly in use among people who aren't um, directly working on epigraphy. Um, and fortunately, um, Rutgers actually has a small collection of squeezes, uh, because uh, Jack Cargill, uh, a historian in the uh, history department, um, kind of wrote the book on the Second Athenian Empire, the Second Athenian Confederation in the fourth century BC, uh, and left the squeezes that he used in the process of writing that book um, to our department, um, which Corey has hung on to. Uh, so we have a collection of them here. So I'm just going to pass them around so that you can take a look at them um, and get a chance to experience squeezes firsthand. Um, be slightly careful with them. And I say that because you don't need to treat them like they're about to fall apart in your hands. Um, don't be afraid to touch them. You don't need to wear white gloves or anything like that. Don't rip them in half. Um, Try not to spill liquid on them is the big thing. Um, other than that, you should be fine. Um, we have a variety of them. The ones that I'm passing around I've selected because we actually have copies uh, of squeezes of these stones at the Institute. And so a little bit later on, I'll show you our digitized versions of the squeezes that you're passing around right now, or of the inscriptions that you're passing around squeezes for. So what are the things that you're looking at right now? Um, they're made of acid-free filter paper, um, which is used otherwise frequently in chemistry applications. Uh, and the importance of that is twofold. One is that it's got a very high wet strength, right? I'm pretty sure everyone here has at some point gotten um, a tissue or a napkin or something like that wet, uh, and it falls apart on you basically immediately, right? Um, to make a squeeze, you need to get the paper wet. So if you had something that was more like tissue paper, um, napkins, uh, even the kind of paper that we write on, uh, it's going to fall apart as soon as you get it wet. So that's no good. Uh, and one of the main things about filter paper is that the way that it's set up in terms of its fibers, it retains a lot of its tensile strength when it gets wet. Um, the other thing is, because it's acid free, uh, it's got very slow deterioration. Um, right? And we're making these things, we want them to last more than a couple of weeks, more than a couple of years. Uh, the squeezes that we have at the Institute mostly come from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, and they're in fairly good shape, given that that they've been folded up and put into boxes and taken out and used uh, fairly extensively in that time. Um, so the acid-free paper helps with that preservation goal. To make a squeeze, basically, you're going to get your filter paper, your blank filter paper wet. You're going to apply it to the stone, whatever stone has your inscription. And then you're going to take a stiff bristled brush, and you're just going to pat over and over again to get that paper into all the crevices on the stone. Uh, and then when it dries, you can remove it from the stone, uh, and you'll have basically a paper negative of the inscription that you've got there. Um, and actually, we're fortunate. Um, I have uh, a video of how exactly this is done. Uh, this is Harlambos Kritsos, uh, who's a previous director of the Epigraphical Museum at Athens, um, which is one of the largest collections of inscriptions in the world. Um, and he's going to show us exactly how you make 
uh, a squeeze. I should say the only downside to this video is that we have not yet translated it from modern Greek. Um, so I'll be commenting on more or less what he's doing. Uh, if you have specific questions about what he's saying, um, Emmanuel uh, or Charles might be able to help you um, with, with picking up on that. Um, because I'm not going to try to translate every word he says for you. So these are the tools that he's working with. He's got the stiff bristled brush that I mentioned, right? And he's showing that it's it's definitely stiff. We're not talking about you know a hairbrush. It's going to have enough force to push things down. Um, that's the acid-free filter paper that he's got there. Um, and you can see he's got another piece here that he's going to use for it later that's actually been cut down so it's about the right size to make a squeeze of the stone in question. Uh, and then he's got a tray that's got water in it and has a sponge in it. Um, the stone that he's going to be using to make the squeeze uh, is resting on kind of a, a foam type pad, um, which is important for two reasons. One, it's going to prevent the stone from moving around as you're hitting it with the brush so that you don't get um, kind of these little macaronis formed out of the paper, which will otherwise happen if it's moving around on you, uh, and so that it protects the bottom of the stone from repeated impacts with the table. So the first thing that he does is he takes the sponge uh, and cleans off the surface of the stone uh, because anything that you have on the stone will get transferred to uh, the squeeze. And so for one thing, that can block up letters. So you want to try to clear the, the channels of the letters. And for another thing, um, if you're not careful about this, you end up with all sorts of gunk on your squeeze. Um, so we've got a lot of squeezes at the Institute that were made uh, kind of in the field, and they often have mud or uh, grass or other things like that on them. If you can avoid that, you do. So you can see he's got the paper now. It's been cut down more or less to the size. Um, and uh, you're going to kind of roll the paper through the water so that the entire thing gets wet. You're going to let the excess water drain out. And again, you can see that this is clearly holding together, right? It's not coming apart at all, despite the fact that it's wet. Um, get most of that excess water out. And then you want to put it down on the stone. And you kind of want to be careful to get as much of the air out as you can so there aren't air bubbles, right? Because otherwise, those will uh, deform the squeeze. So then you get the brush. Um, and this is the key part, but it's also the hard part, is that you're going to strike down, right? And the difficulty is you have to actually strike down with force. Um, and a lot of people are uncomfortable doing this because they're worried that they'll destroy the stone by doing this. Um, but if you don't push down with enough force, then you don't get anything on the squeeze. Um, so it's, it's a balance between you really you don't want to slam your hand down. And you can see that he's mostly using his forearm, right? The forearm is the only thing that's moving. Um, and you want to get enough pressure that you're creating it, but not enough pressure that you're going to damage things. Um, and then you start in the middle. Uh, again, to kind of try to get rid of air bubbles and move around towards the outside. Um, and the important thing that he's really trying to get is the text, which is in the middle here. And he gets some of the decorative elements and some of the sides of the stone. But you're not going to be obsessed with getting all of that information, because that's not really what the squeeze is for. Um, and again, you can see that he's pressing straight down with the brush. He's not moving the brush, right? Don't, don't think that you can get the air out by doing that, because again, you'll create these little, little uh, rolls, these little macaroni. And you can see it does not take very long to make a squeeze, right? Or at least to do this portion of making the squeeze. The thing that really takes a significant amount of time is going to zoom in here so you can see a little bit what it looks like on the top. Um, what really takes a significant amount of time then is that this has to, to dry. Um, so if you are in Greece in the middle of the summer and it's a hot day, this will dry relatively quickly. Um, if it's the winter, the wet months, then uh, it may take longer to dry, right? It may take an, an hour, a couple hours. Right, so you can see, nice, nicely picks up just about everything, mostly making sure that you've got the letters. So it's going to be dry. You're going to pick it up, kind of peel it off, um, and then you'll be left essentially with something that looks like what we passed around, right? Um, so. Why are we making these in the first place, right? Before we can get to why are we digitizing squeezes, why are squeezes useful, right? Because if squeezes themselves aren't useful, then digitizing them sure as heck isn't useful. Um, so the reasons for a squeeze, how you use a squeeze, the, the main importance is that it records the face of an inscription. And this is important because frequently we assimilate 
an inscription to the text of that inscription, right? Uh, but these are not, in fact, the same thing. Uh, the text of an inscription is usually a published interpretation of what can be read on that inscription by a professional epigrapher, whereas the face of an inscription is something that looks like this, right? Um, so the difference between the two is that this is going to show you letters that are partial, right? This is going to show you the shapes of the letters. Um, this is going to show you exactly what's on the stone. A text will show you things like restorations that have been made, right? Suggested completions of lines. Uh, frequently, it's going to show you letters as being complete letters that if you looked at the stone, you would be absolutely amazed because there's a single vertical line or something like that. And someone has decided that that's definitely a new. Um, so working directly with the surface of the stone is important. And that's what a squeeze is, is essentially a copy of that surface of the stone. And it's a copy of that surface of the stone at a particular moment in time. And this, again, is critical because stones deteriorate, right? Um, they deteriorate naturally once you've pulled them out of the ground and they're sitting out in the open air and people are coming by and looking at them and touching them and they're being moved from place to place, from apotheki to apotheki, right? They slowly deteriorate. And there's any number of, of times you'll read a book and you will see so-and-so saw in 1892 these letters. Those letters are no longer visible. Right? Um, so if you have a squeeze from that moment, then you'll have a pretty good idea of what was visible on the stone at that time and whether that person was just overstating what could be seen or whether, in fact, the surface of the stone has degraded. Uh, and in addition to simple natural degradation, uh, we have, for example, a fairly large collection uh, from Macedonia, from Greek Macedonia, uh, that were made by Charles Edson in the late 30s. Um, and what happened shortly after the late 30s was World War II, right? And World War II was particularly brutal in northern Greece. Um, and quite a few of the stones that were made squeezes of in that process um, may well be entirely gone at this point. Um, and so these squeezes then preserve essentially the only uh, remaining evidence of those faces. So we have that. Um, another thing that it does is it allows an inspection of this surface of the stone in multiple places at the same time, right? Uh, because we can be looking at this stone here at the same time as someone in the Epigraphic Museum at Athens is looking at the exact same stone. In this case, not so much because it's 10 PM there, and the Epigraphic Museum is only open until 3. But in theory, we could both be looking at it at the same time. Um, and if we have four or five squeezes, right, two of the squeezes I passed around are squeezes of the same stone, then two people can be looking at this on different sides of the Rutgers campus at the same time. Right? Um, additionally, it is much easier to move and provide helpful lighting with a squeeze than it is with a stone, right? Um, with any kind of an inscription, looking at it with harsh, straight-on lighting is not very useful, right? You want to kind of get raking lighting, which is going to make shadows and help you see the letters that you have on there. Uh, and that's very easy to do if you can get nice light and move around what you're looking at. Um, however, if we're looking at the Epigraphic Museum, uh, and this is me and a colleague doing RTI in the Epigraphic Museum, you will see that in some ca cases we have inscriptions that look like this, right? And it's very difficult to take one of those pieces, pull it out of the plaster, walk over to a light surface, and look at it. We also have stones that look like this or like this, where even if you could pull them up, they probably weigh well over 100 pounds. So you're not simply going to walk around with it and look at it in the light, right? And squeezes would allow you to look at those stones uh, and move them around and work with them in a way that you can't work with the actual stones. They are also possible to inspect in bulk, right? So one of the people who works with us on this project is Stephen Tracy, um, professor of epigraphy uh, and ancient history from Ohio State. Um, and his life's work has been detecting and analyzing the handwriting of individual masons. Um, so how can you tell who wrote a particular inscription and if they wrote multiple inscriptions? Uh, and to do that, basically you have to be able to look at a whole lot of inscriptions in short order. Right? And again, you can't do that if the inscriptions weigh 200 pounds and are immured in concrete. Um, and if you want to look at 100 or 200 of these stones to try to figure out which three of them are by the same mason, it's basically an impossible task with the stones themselves. So this is a place where squeezes are really useful. Our collection itself, what do we have in our collection? Um, so 
the major bulk of the collection is from the Epigraphic Museum and is from the Agora, the ancient Agora at Athens. Um, the materials at the Epigraphic Museum and um, the Agora at Athens kind of come from the association of Benjamin Merritt um, with those projects. So Benjamin Merritt was the first professor of history at the Institute uh, and he convinced the director in 1936 to lay out the enormous at the time sum of $500 um, to the Epigraphical Museum in Athens to make squeezes of their entire collection, um, which at the time was over 13,000 inscriptions. Um, over 8,500 of those inscriptions were squeezed, uh, and we have those squeezes in our collection. Um, they also had, so they had three people who were working at the Epigraphic Museum. They also had one person who was working at the Acropolis, and one person who was working with the stones at Eleusis. Uh, our collection of Eleusinian materials has increased significantly because Kevin Clinton, uh, who kind of wrote the book on Eleusinian uh, inscriptions donated his squeezes to us um, after finishing those books. Uh, so we have those three. We, they also solicited uh, kind of contributions from the Ashmolean, the British Museum, and the Archaeological Museum at Izmir, um, all of which had notable collections of inscriptions um, from Greek antiquity, which was Merritt's major interest. Additionally, Merritt was in charge of publishing uh, and dealing with the inscriptions that were found in the excavation of the ancient Agora at Athens, which the American School of Classical Studies had taken over in 1931. Um, so every time they dug something out of the ground that was inscribed, the plan was you squeezed it, you sent the squeeze over to Princeton, and Merritt from Princeton uh, worked together with the Hesperia office there to publish uh, those inscriptions. Um, and that continued for the entire period during which Homer Thompson was the head of the dig there. Uh, when he retired and Leslie Shear took over uh, from Princeton, the squeezes stopped coming. So we have squeezes up to seven Agora I-71. One three five um, at the institute, and then a smattering of later ones, but that's mostly where we cut off. Um, so you can see that's a huge amount of the collection that we have is kind of those two areas, uh, and for many of those we have multiple copies, sometimes two, sometimes more. We also got a couple of later bequests. I already mentioned Kevin Clinton's bequest of Eleusinian materials, um, but we also have one from William H. Buckler, which is the earliest one, and that one came already in 1936, uh, and that was squeezes from Sardis and Asia Minor. Um, David Robinson uh, donated his squeezes from Chalcidice and uh, Asia Minor as well in 1950. Uh, Charles Edson is the one who had the material from Macedonia uh, that he donated, and that was from his, um, his excavations there in 36 through 38, uh, he's got about 800 squeezes. And then um, Louis Robert, who's one of the most famous uh, epigraphers of the 20th century, along with his wife, Jean Robert. Um, as you see, the numbers are a little bit confusing. Um, when I got there, there had never been a real comprehensive catalog done of the materials, and so the internal estimates I got uh, slowly escalated and ranged from 20,000 to 70,000. So when people ask me, when is this project going to be finished, I say, I don't know. It depends on whether we have 20,000 squeezes or 70,000 squeezes, because, you know, it's a factor of three and a half. So uh, we can't exactly say, oh yeah, it's going to be a couple of years, and then it turns out that we had four times as much material as we thought. Uh, my guess at this point is that it's closer to 20,000 than 70,000. I think we're going to be somewhere in the 30 to 35,000 range. So. Why digitize these squeezes? We've got this collection, we know what squeezes are. Why are we digitizing this collection? Um, inscriptions are a vital source for our understanding of ancient history, right? In many cases, they are our only primary source look, um, textual look anyway, at ancient historical facts. And on top of that, they often give evidence that ancient historians thought was uninteresting or unimportant. Um, as many of you know, I've worked previously on the Athenian tribute lists, um, which many people consider to be a critical element of both ancient finance uh, and ancient interstate politics, but are glossed over almost entirely by the ancient sources. But fortunately, um, the Athenians were very interested in recording this material and recording it largely and in great detail. Uh, and a lot of that survives, and so we can learn a whole lot about aspects of antiquity through this material, through inscriptional material. However, in general, this material survives in fragments. 
And so as a result, like I said, you know, we have an inscription that looks like this. And obviously, there are lots of parts of this missing. So to try to figure out what's said, people look at a lot of them and then restore portions based on formulae. These are often formulaic, so you can figure out what might have been said in the gaps. Um, and when you are going to restore, when you're going to try to figure out what's there, um, you need to be looking at the surface of the stone. Right? This is the important difference that I was talking about. So if you have an argument that hinges critically on what's on an inscription, you need to be able to look at the inscription, not just at a published text of the inscription. And that creates a real problem, because that means you need to have experience and some degree of comfort looking at and working with the surfaces of inscriptions. And previously, many schools, probably far and away most schools, had neither a collection of inscriptions nor a collection of squeezes. And as such, had no real way to give their undergraduate or graduate students any experience or comfort in working directly with inscriptions. And that means that we produce relatively few professional epigraphers. And that also means that most classicists are not comfortable being part-time epigraphers. And so this is one of the big things that we are hoping to change with digitized databases like Crateros, is by having a huge collection of easily accessible, open access, online images of essentially the faces of inscriptions, we would democratize the profession of epigraphy. So more people would be able to become comfortable with working with the surfaces of inscriptions to propose different readings to say, hey, I've looked at this really closely. I don't think that's an alpha. Right? I think that that's actually a lambda. Right? And here's why, if you change it from an alpha to a lambda, that makes a big difference in, say, the archon name that's on this text. And that changes the date of it. And if we change the date of it by five years, here's how that changes our entire understanding of the Archidamian War. Right? To make that argument is relatively easy if you have access to the face of the inscription. It's basically impossible if you don't. Uh, and it can cost quite a bit for you to travel to Greece to look at the inscription in the Epigraphic Museum. Um, and most people don't know about collections like the Institute's collection, so they don't know that they could travel to Princeton if they had the wherewithal to travel to Princeton and get access to that collection there. There's also some very exciting deep learning potential with creating a really large database of images of squeezes, right? Um, so I mentioned Steve Tracy's kind of lifetime pursuit of identifying Mason's hands. Um, well, Steve is basically the only person in the world who does this well. Steve's not going to be around forever. So we need to find out a way to replicate what Steve does. And there was an attempt that Steve made with a group of mathematicians and computer scientists in Athens to replicate this with a computer identifying Mason's hands. And they had some success with it. The problem was it was too time consuming. There weren't a lot of existing images, good photographs of the fronts of inscriptions to work from. And so they weren't able to get funding to move on to the next stage doing this on a large scale. Well, we're solving one of those problems just by virtue of our database existing. Right Now there is a huge collection of the faces of inscriptions available openly online. Um, in addition, in the last 15 years, machine learning has made extraordinary jumps in the ability of computers to identify patterns, uh, figure out how the computer would take that material and make the next step, as opposed to just us programming in what we think the computer should do to identify patterns. Right? So we're going to be working with Princeton University and their computer science department to try to get a program set up that would do what Steve does on our body of inscriptions, see whether we can create a, a more uh, sustainable, automated version of Steve Tracy. <laughs> So what do we do? What is the digitization process? Uh, we looked at a variety of methods for digitizing squeezes, uh, and we left some aside. Uh, we didn't use RTI or photogrammetry, both of which uh, I'm familiar with and I'm sure some of you have heard me talk about before, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was the problem of display and file format. right? So RTI does not create a file format that everyone's computer can just pick up and use. You have to have downloaded a program uh, to be able to look at an RTI file. Um, and there is an applet that allows you to display these files in websites, uh, but it's not supported all that much anymore, and it doesn't allow you to do all of the uh, nuanced work with the RTI file that the reader can do. Um, so it's really not an ideal situation. 
Um, photogrammetry, we tried and really did not do a great job of picking up the little teeny details, little teeny depth details uh, in the squeezes. Um, and one of the great things about photogrammetry is that it picks up color beautifully. Um, it really picks up the surface of an object. We do not care about color in the surface of an object for these things, right? All we want is that nitty gritty depth map. Um, and so photogrammetry just was not a good choice. Uh, expense and capture time was the other big thing with both of these, right? Um, with RTI, if you do it by hand, it's going to take a long time for each squeeze. Um, I made a dome with Rick um, to work on the coin collection that we have here, the Badian coin collection. Um, and that can do things a lot more quickly. But the field of focus is about yay big, right? And if you've got a squeeze this size, which by the way is a very small squeeze, you're still going to have to shoot it somewhere between four and eight times, or you're going to have to build a dome that's four to eight times the size, and our dome is already yay big by yay wide, right? Um, and uh, we have a bunch of squeezes at the Institute um, that are at least this long, and often somewhere between five to 10 times this wide, right? We have some squeezes that are easily four foot wide by 10 foot long. Um, so that would take a heck of a lot of time. Um, or it would take building a dome into an enormous room and then using a camera that's got 50 megapixels or something like that, which would cost you an inordinate amount of money. So we set that aside and decided to use scanning. Um, so the scanner that we use is a wide tech 25600 flatbed scanner. This is the same technology for digitization that Ohio State uses for their collection, which includes most of Steve Tracy's squeezes. Um, and you can actually see right here, this is what the scanner looks like. Um, we have two of these scanners uh, at the institute that we work with. They look mostly identical except in one of them. I've taken these hinges off. Uh, and the reason for that is so that we can deal with squeezes that are this size, that are long like that. Um, because when we have a squeeze that's larger than the squeeze bed, we run it through and take multiple pictures. So we take one picture, two picture, three picture, four picture. And then we put those pictures together with the photo merge function in Photoshop. But when we're using this scanner, we're using it with a 3D lighting function, which means that you get this 45 degree raking light on the squeeze. And this is, is great. It produces great results in terms of readability. But it means that a squeeze looks different. It produces a different photograph if it's going in right side up as opposed to upside down. So you can't take the squeeze and scan it in one direction and then turn it around and scan it in the other direction and plug the two together. They don't work. They won't look good together. Um, so we have to be able to run the whole thing through. As I said, we don't care about the color information, right? So we do it in grayscale. Uh, and the initial scanning creates 600 DPI TIFFs. These are enormous files, especially if you're photo merging them together, right? We have some photo merged files that are well over 10 gigabytes for a single image. Those are not the files that we're putting on the internet. The files that we're putting on the internet are, are noticeably smaller, but we are keeping those 600 DPI TIFFs as archival images. Um, we also scan every squeeze twice. Uh, so we scan the squeeze once, right side up, as it were, and then we rotate the squeeze 90 degrees to the right, and we scan it again. And there are two reasons for that. One is that this is raking light, and so it does a great job of picking up items that are perpendicular. So if you've got an iota, and the light is hitting it like this, it shows up beautifully. If you've got an iota, and the light is hitting it like this, it doesn't show up at all. So by turning it 90 degrees and having those two images, you're got a pretty good shot on one of them at picking up just about every line on the squeeze. So by looking at the two of them, you get a really good coverage. So that's one reason. The other reason is there's a procedure that the University of Florida has developed that's called shape from shading, by which you can take these two images uh, and feed them through a program, and it will create a 3D rendering of the object that you photographed. So I'm going to show you one of those a little bit later on. We're not currently automatically doing that for all of our squeezes, but by having all of these double photographs, if and when we're ready to, we can simply set it up, plug it, and throw them all through, and then we'll have all of those to be used. In terms of what we do um, after we've scanned them, so we've got these scans, um, we rotate all the images. Obviously, if it comes through right side up, we don't need to rotate it, right? Um, but for the one that we've got 90 degrees rotated, we rotate it right side up. The next thing is we unmirror it. Right? Um, these are negatives, as I said, which means that they're the opposite of what you'd expect. You get pretty used to working with that um, when you're actually reading them. Um, but 
if you're not that used to it, it can be a real bar to looking at them. And there's no difficulty in unmirroring them on the computer, right? We just flip the canvas uh, in Photoshop and it's fine. And then we slightly adjust the brightness and contrast. Um, so we turn the brightness down a little bit and the contrast up a little bit to help the readability. We do that uniformly. So we make the exact same brightness and contrast change on every single squeeze. This means that it's not always the perfect amount of adjustment, but it's being scientifically done, right? So we're not reading our biases into the end image. We're just trying to produce a uniform set of results. We are also keeping these untouched copies of every single one of these squeezes so that if someone thinks, hey, the changes you've made have changed the image, they've changed the squeeze, um, we can give them an untouched copy and they can do whatever adjustments they feel are useful to them. As I said, too large for a scanner bed, we photo merge them together, and then we reduce them to 300 dpi and we save them as JPEGs to be hosted online. Um, and then we preserve those full size ones offline. So let's take a look. We have a website and we have a database. Um, let's see if we can pull this up. There we go. So this is what our website looks like. Um, and you can see this is actually one of the scanned squeezes back here. This is IG221. Um, and then we've got some overview of the project um, as well as the digitization. And we've got several different things you can look at. Um, the project has mostly data that we've already talked about. Um, so what the images are, uh, how they're done, what the workflow is, the technologies used, uh, as well as the information about metadata. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and it also has a little bit of a gallery so people can get an, a chance to look at some of the squeezes. Um, and there are 16 of them in here right now. I should say we chose like the 16 most beautiful squeezes that we possibly could for this. There are many in the collection that are essentially unreadable or are just seven letters or something like that. Um, but the ones that we've got here have beautiful different levels of size to them um, or have a guy standing in a boat holding an ear of corn, you know, just absolutely ridiculous things um, that show up very rarely. Then we have some background information on squeezes. You can see that horse is back. Um, and uh, so information about the collection, information about what squeezes are, a little bit of uh, an example of the use of squeezes from day to day, um, and an overview of Crateros itself, who the project team are, funding sources, how to get in touch with us. Uh, and then from there, go back, we go to the database. And our database, which is called Albert because the Institute for Advanced Study is obsessed with Albert Einstein because he was there and he's our talisman. Um, it's a DSpace database, um, which is a customizable open source repository software, right? So it's kind of a package that you get and then you have your CompSci team uh, un unbox it and make it fit the use case that you have. And it's searchable and browsable using Apache Solar. So this is kind of the search functionality that um, gets piggybacked on to create all the kind of Google searching, uh, library ca uh, catalog searching, um, Amazon searching, all that stuff that you're used to. That functionality is created more or less uh, on the back of Apache Solar. Um, we're not entirely happy with the current functionality of our searching and browsing. And so that's one of the things that we're looking at kind of upgrading, um, possibly by getting a separate discovery layer, right? So instead of trying to use the database, um, both to do discovery uh, and to do hosting of these objects, let the database host the objects and have a separate uh, thing that will let you search and browse in a really useful uh, and common sense way. Um, yeah, so this is what Albert looks like. Um, We'll go to Crateros, which is our homepage. Um, and you can see a teeny bit of an overview. And then our submissions, right, our recent things. Um, you can see there is some browsability on the right. Uh, so we could be interested in, say, citizenship decrees um, and could bring up an example of a citizenship decree. Um, and you'll see here, this is what's called our simple item record, which is what everyone's going to see when they just navigate to an entry in the database. We've got a category for it, right? We've got a title. It's not called a title, but we've got our, our um, Inscriptiones Graecae 
two slash three second edition, right? So Athens and Attica after 403 slash two um, and the second edition of that um, and which number it is. And then the category. So this is a citizenship decree, right? It's a decree that's granting citizenship to some kind of benefactor of the city of Athens. Um, we've got a location, Athens. We've got a general date, fourth century BCE, right? That four with an A, fourth century ante, fourth century BCE. And then a specific date that's drawn directly from the IG 2-2 publication. Um, so in this case, sometime a little bit before 336, 335. We've got links out to the PHI, the Packard Humanities Institute's searchable Greek inscriptions corpus. Um, so if we open that, um, we'll get something that looks a little like this, right? Um, and this is a great example of a published text which has a lot of restorations. So we click on that, and this is what you would actually see on the squeeze itself, right? Um, and so that gives you an idea of just how much is being filled in by folks and why it's so important to be able to look at the front of the inscription. We also have links to um, Attic Inscriptions Online, which does English translations of uh, inscriptions. Um, and this is coming along more slowly than Packard. Packard's got just about everything. Um, the Attic Inscriptions Online is coming along a little bit at a time. But any case Cases where they do exist, we've got them on there. They've also got some really nice uh, additional information, including some geotagging. So if you're interested in where exactly the object was found, AIO is great for that. Um, and you'll see that they're, they've been nice enough to link out to us. Um, so if you're using AIO um, and we have an image of that, you'll be able to get to us from there and look at the, the object itself. Um, and then we've got you know, use and permissions. All this stuff is open and available to be used. We want you to use it. Um, just when you have a publication that's using it, make sure you note where it came from, where the image came from, um, and if possible, send us a copy, a digital copy of the, the publication. Um, so we can use it to show that this is worthwhile and put more things up and keep it up and running. Then we have the files. Um, so we've got files in the item, uh, and we can take a look at them. This is our Mirador viewer, which lets you view it in line uh, in your browser, right? Um, and so you can see this looks a lot like what we saw in PHI when you took off the little bracket stuff, right? This is clearly one of those corners. Um, and this is what our production looks like. And you can see this is one of two, and you can barely see like the iotas on this. If we looked at two, those would stand out a lot more. Um, so that's what it looks like in line. You can also click on the view open, which will bring it up like this and that. Uh, if you right click on it, we'll let you save it. So that's how you can easily download all these things. Like I said, we want you to use all of them. They're all available. Um, the full item record gives you an idea of kind of the breadth of metadata that we have because we don't put all of that metadata that we're putting in there up on the simple item record because we want that to be usable. But this is machine usable. This is readable uh, and searchable. So for example, we actually have two pieces of location information in this. Um, we don't just have Athens. We also have a more generalized one, Attica. Um, almost all of our inscriptions come from the Greek world. If we had a broader base, if we were also looking at inscriptions from Spain or from the UK or something like that, um, then we would probably have a broader one yet that said Greece. Um, so that if you were interested in specifically inscriptions from Greece, you could browse for that, you could search for that, and then all of these would come up, both from Athens and Eleusis and what have you. Um, we also have the same thing going on with the category, right? So I said that the category was a citizenship decree. So you can see one subject is citizenship decree. That's what's shown on that simple record. But we also have a decree on there. So if you want to see all decrees, citizenship decrees, proxy decrees, uh, alliance and treaty decrees, um, you can search or browse by decree and then all of these will come up. Um, and then there's a couple of items in here that are mostly for machines. So for example, we say what the MIME type is, so it's a JPEG image. Um, we say what the language is, so uh, including the ISO code, so that machines are able to take this information and use it um, from site to site, so it can cross walk over to other sites. All right. So. So far, we've talked a lot about necessities and how we're doing things. I also mentioned difficulties uh, in 
the name of my talk. Um, and the big difficulty, the thorny problem, is how do you give a stable, unique identifier to a text that naturally fluctuates? Right? Because you may have four fragments, one of which looks like this, that make up a text. And then tomorrow, one scholar says, fragment C doesn't belong in this text. And two other scholars say, fragment C definitely belongs in this text. And another fragment that I found yesterday also belongs in this text. Right? So what do you call this text? What does this text include? What do you call those pieces? that may or may not be part of the text. Because in digital humanities, we want a stable code. We want a name for this thing, right? But this thing isn't stable. And so trying to figure out what we're supposed to do with that, what is the code, what, are, what is the item that we're putting up here, has been an incredible difficulty. And it's not one that I think is going to get easier, in part because to have a solution to this problem, everyone's going to have to agree on it. And it's very difficult in any academic subject, as I'm sure you're aware, to get 6 out of 24 people to agree on something, much less 24 out of 24. Um, so this creates a real difficulty for databases and computers, which want to have a 1-0 answer, um, and the scholars who want to tell you that it's 7.5 out of 1 or 0. So a couple of options. Um, we could think about dissociating fragments from texts, especially in the way that we're naming them. Right? So we can name these objects by their Agora inscription number, their epigraphic museum number, because realistically that shouldn't change as a matter of opinion. Someone could drop the stone and it could break into two parts, right? but then the previous stone doesn't exist anymore. That number can be removed and you need two new names for those two new pieces. right? But that's not a question of opinion. No one's able to say, no, 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 I think really that's still one thing, right? If I just look, squint hard enough, it's going to be one thing, right? You're going to have two different things. It's not a matter of opinion anymore. The difficulty there is that, of course, fragments don't have the meaning that texts do, right? You got one of these fragments, like the one that we looked at, that's got five, ten letters on it, right? You combine it with four other fragments, and suddenly it's a citizenship decree from 336, 335 BCE, where by itself, it's gamma gamma, upsilon mu mu, right? This is not a meaningful thing. So the kind of informational metadata that goes with these things goes with texts and not with fragments. So we may need to have two layers, one of texts and one of fragments. So where are we now with this project? Uh, we've scanned a little over 9,000 of the squeezes in the collection, 9,339. Uh, we've photoshopped almost all of those already. Those are kind of ready to be uh, sent on to the next stage. And the next stage is where the bottleneck has been so far. So of those 8,700 squeezes that we have photoshopped, we've got about a quarter of them with full metadata. Uh, and the reason for that difficulty is that, as I said, most of this metadata comes from IG22, which which is published in Latin. Um, and so to put up accurate metadata for these things, the person who's looking at it needs to be able to read the Greek of the squeeze and read the Latin that's in the IG22 and make heads or tails of it. So you need to hire someone who's essentially a PhD in classics. Um, and that's more expensive than the person that you would hire to scan um, or Photoshop squeezes. right? So, so far, it's basically me and Aaron Beck Schachter doing all of the work on that. And it takes time. It takes five to 10 minutes, basically, per inscription to go through that stuff and figure out what we're going to say. Um, of those 2,218 with the metadata, uh, 1,148 are already uploaded, um, can, which constitute 630 uh, database entries. The others are basically ready to get updated, uh, uploaded. Excuse me. We had an update to our metadata protocols. And so that had to get pushed through uh, to the database before we could put new materials in there. So they're kind of sitting on the desk of the comp sci people to go up online. Where are we going? So we've created entries that are going to enable our tradition, tr transition from IG22 to IG23. Right? So IG2, second edition, came out in 1913, 1920, 1930, that period. Uh, there's a new set of these coming out. Um, Graham Oliver, who came by to give a talk uh, back in the fall, um, is responsible for one of the volumes of this. And he was hoping that it would be out relatively soon. Um, so hopefully that'll be out soon-ish. Um, but 
about four or five of the volumes of this, what will eventually probably be closer to nine or ten, um, are already out. So we need to start transitioning, but because not all of them are out, we can't fully transition. Um, so we're going to create these uh, as kind of text metadata entries without images. The images will be associated with IG22, with EM numbers or Agara numbers, and then once IG23 is finished, we'll be able to move those images over to the IG23 entries. We're also adding Trismegistos numbers, and some of you may be familiar with Trismegistos. It's kind of an online attempt to give, again, stable unique identifier numbers to classical texts. It kind of started out with Egyptian uh, papyri and inscriptions, but has moved on to be more general. Uh, and that's being used by a project called epigraphy.info. Uh, and some of you, again, may be uh, aware of papyri.info, which is the papyrologist's attempt to create a kind of single clearinghouse to work together online on problems. Um, and epigraphy.info is a very recent attempt to do the same thing for epigraphic studies. Uh, and they're going to organize theirs by Trismegistos numbers. So we add Trismegistos numbers to ours, the machines can talk to each other, and you can reach one place from the other. We're also exploring the possibility of including SFS on Albert. So I mentioned SFS earlier, and now we can take a look at one of these, because they're really pretty spectacular. So this is what it looks like when you get the computer and it takes those two uh, images and puts them together. Um, and in this viewer, you can physically manipulate this 3D image, um, and you can also manipulate the lighting. Um, so you can change the lighting angle to try to get to an angle that gives you as good a reading as you can possibly have. So this is really an exciting um, possibility, and the important thing is um, we want to make sure that we get it to a spot where uh, our information kind of is on our own, her own servers, so we can make sure that it's up, that it, it stays available, um, and so that we have a viewer that we can put in our database in the same way that the Mirador viewer lets you look at JPEGs. Um, so that's hopefully relatively soon down the line. Um, we're also working on updated preservation and housing for the squeeze collection itself, because we're not just going to throw these things away after we scan them. Like I said, they're 90 years old sometimes, um, and they need some love. Um, so we're going to try to figure out what kind of uh, room they need to be in, what kind of boxes we need to put them in, things like that. So we are thinking of those. We're not just going to throw them aside. Uh, and we're sourcing community feedback, right? Because if folks like you aren't interested in using the project, then at the end of the day, it's not going to make a lot of sense. Um, so that kind of brings me to thanking all of you for coming out and, and listening to me chatter um, and uh, asking if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, please um, let me know. I'll be happy to take them. <laughs>